This is lesson number two in Spirit and Truth, the Fundamentals of Biblical, biblical Worship, and tonight the practice of biblical worship, which is submission. Now last week I started this series on biblical worship by explaining that the essence of worship is communication. Whether in private or at public worship, our goal in worship is to communicate with God. I also reviewed the various languages we use to communicate with God. And these languages are prayer languages. Talked about prayers of praise, prayers of mercy and supplication, prayers of request, prayers of confession, confirmation, prayers of remembrance, prayers of adoration, prayers of wonder. Notice they're all prayers, but they're very different types of prayers, are they not? We tend to kind of lock into one type of prayer and always repeat that same type of prayer, but there are many different types of prayer. And this is the language of communication between God and and men. Now remember that if you're not communicating with God, you're not really worshiping. You may be at a worship event, but you're not worshiping. There has to be communication. All right, so we've talked about the essence of worship, which is communication, and the various languages used to communicate with God. We've listed several of these here in the overhead. Next question, how do you get good at worship. I hear that all the time. We need to improve our worship. We need to get better at worship. Okay, how do you do that? I want to go back to my sports analogy you know, that I did in the first lesson, talked about the Olympic sport analogy. I said that sports is about competition and winning. You get good at your sport by training, by practice, by competing often. And your type of training depends on the type of sport you have. One thing I learned, very interesting, I saw a program that showed how Olympic table tennis, you know what table ping pong, Olympic table tennis players, one of their main training methods, you know what it is? Skip and rope. Because in professional table tennis, there's a lot of lateral movement from side to side, a lot of footwork, you really have to move your feet very quickly, and skipping rope, like for boxers, helps develop quick and accurate footwork. So you know, the type of training you do, depending on the sport that you do. So uh, we go back into our uh, lesson idea. So what's the practice or what's the training for worship? How do you improve your communication abilities with God? Answer in one word, submission. Submission. This is an easy one to figure out because the Hebrew and the Greek words in the Bible translated into the English word worship convey this idea. In the Hebrew, shaka, to bow down, to prostrate oneself. In the Greek, proskuneo, to kiss or to kiss forward, or to do reverence or to bow down before. The words themselves give an image of one who was in submission to and reverence of another one, usually God. And so the practice of worship, the spirit of worship, the way one actually approaches God for the communication is in a position of submission. So in answer to the question, how do we improve our worship services? One should reply, learn and practice greater submission to God. This will improve your communication or slash worship with God. Of course, that's not what men do, is it? It isn't what we do. No, we try other things to improve our worship. In order to improve our worship, we codify our rituals and we make these the practice of our worship. In other words, we think the value of our worship is tied to the correctness of our rituals rather than the submission of our wills to God. Now we're going to improve our worship. Oh yeah, how are we going to do that? We're going to learn five new songs. Well, that's good, but that doesn't necessarily improve your communication with God. Of course, this is a normal human phenomenon when it comes to worshiping God and 
in religion in general. For example, Muslims do this very same thing. They have the five pillars of faith which guide their entire religious and worship experience. Pillar one, confession. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Pillar number two, almsgiving, the two and a half percent, the zakat. Everyone needs to give two and a half percent. Pillar number three, prayer, five times per day facing Mecca. Pillar number four, fasting, Ramadan, the holy month. Pillar number five, pilgrimage to Mecca, at least once in a lifetime. These practices become their worship. The better they do it, the better their worship. Nothing new here. The Sikh religion has the same formula for worship and religious life. They call it the five Ks. The Kesh, which is the long hair, you know, and the, uh, the long beard. The Kanja, the comb or the turban. The Kachara, the shorts or the cotton undergarments. The Kara, the steel bracelet that they wear. And the Kirpan, which is the sword, usually a small knife that they carry. You want another example of people who codify their rituals and make that their, their exercise of worship? How about the Jews, the Orthodox Jews? Orthodox Jews with the yarmulkel, you know, the, the skull cap, long sideburns, the curls, the round hats, the long black coats, the dress. They codify that and somehow that improves their worship, their communication with God. So every religion tries to codify their rituals or their particular dress and focus exclusively on these things to create or even enhance their worship to God. This, in their minds, improves the worship. In some instances, we do the same, don't we? We think that improving our a cappella singing is the way to improve our worship. So we spend money to uh, expand the, our auditoriums, we add cry rooms, we create uh, PowerPoint images, we hire more ministers or we fire the one that we have, we add worship teams, we start clapping, we get women to pray. Why? Because this will somehow improve our worship. We focus on the rituals, we focus on the mechanics rather than the spirit, thinking that changes on the outside will create changes on the inside. And yet we know, the Bible teaches us as that change and worship and spiritual things must first take place on the inside before outside things are affected. Listen to the words of somebody who really knew how to worship God in spirit and truth. He said, the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit you will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. That have anything to do with new songbooks? How close to the front or how far from the front you sit? Psalm 34, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And doesn't Jesus say, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 5, 3? And Paul summarizes perfectly the entire issue of the practice of worship when he says the following in Romans 12, 1, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. How, 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 we, how do we glide over this particular verse here? When thinking, about worship. I mean, I've been in the church long enough to have sat on, quote, worship committees. And the agenda was, how are we going to improve our worship? And, and, and I, I mean, I bought into it too for a time. Almost every one of these meetings always, always had to do with the mechanics. How do we improve the mechanics? The essence of worship is communi communication using the language of prayer and praise. 
The spiritual exercise, the vehicle that brings our communication before God is our submissive hearts, our submissive wills. You know, if worship were like a computer, because not everybody's into sports, let's use the computer analogy then. It's like the rituals and the building and the order of worship, that's the hardware. The language of communication, praise, request, supplication, confession, this is the software. That's what brings the computer to life. But submission of one's will to God, that's the internet connection. That's how you make contact. Now this example may be easy to understand but not easy to apply because we are sometimes confused about how each part works. So here are some common mistakes that we make or sometimes common errors that we think. First of all, sometimes we think it's all about the hardware when we're talking about worship and improving it. It's all about the hardware. We got to maintain the status quo. Two songs, one prayer, communion, sermon, invitation song, closing prayer, out the door. All the energy is used to maintain the building and the personnel so we can repeat the process once or more during a week. We resist any change based on our belief that we have restored New Testament Christianity by building this hardware and no change is needed or permitted. There's a problem here. The problem is this ideology doesn't understand what biblical worship is. And the result, many times, dry and lifeless churches, dwindling in members, poor spiritual lives, small faith. Or we think it's all about the software. Let's get rid of the bulky hardware. Let's upgrade to an iPad or an iPhone to get the iPhone 10. In other words, let's, let's do house churches. Or let's experiment with other ways to feel about God. Let's encourage spiritual experimentation, tongues. Hey, let's have women prophesying in tongues in public. Let's go all out. <laughs> Why not? It's all about communication, isn't it? This extreme forgets that the communication, the worship with and before God is regulated by Him in His word and not by us. He gives us the language. He establishes the significance of the rituals and their forms. He provides the guidelines for how and when we worship and for what purpose. Him, He does this, He gives us that. And this is where submission comes in. I want to read Romans 12, 1 over again, but out of another version that kind of brings out you know, different aspects of this uh, particular verse. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all He has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that He will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship Him. Notice here, there's no mechanics here. There's no hardware here. Paul explains that our personal, daily, spiritual worship is expressed mainly in the way we submit our bodies to God in purity, service, and obedience. I may not have the opportunity or time to articulate my worship in words to communicate my love and praise to God. However, the actions of my body as I submit to His will in the way that I think and act are a continual act of worship, are, as Paul says, a true spiritual worship to Him. And I haven't, e I haven't even cracked open a songbook. In this way, my actions and my words form a unified communication that serve as my complete devotion to the Lord each day. Uh, at some point in the day, I will be tempted to honor myself at the expense of someone else. The words are just on the tip of my tongue and if I say them, I'm going to feel really good about myself because I have elevated myself 
by stepping on someone else. We all do it, right? And at that very moment, the Spirit of God will remind me that God raises the humble and He lowers the, pr the proud. Or will remind me that before a fall comes pride. And I will hopefully bite my tongue and not say the thing that would so gratify my flesh and just swallow it and let it go. I have worshiped God right there. I have offered my flesh to Him right then and there. The best advice I heard to start this process, someone said, learn to say no to yourself one time a day. <laughs> just learn to say no to yourself one time a day. As I said, in this way, my actions and my words form a unified communication that serve as my complete devotion to the Lord. When Jesus said that God was looking for those who would worship Him in spirit and truth, this is what He meant. Submission on a daily basis permits one to be in a worship mode constantly. An idea much superior to the Muslim concept of daily prayer repeated five times facing Mecca. What, five times a day, that's it? You're boasting about that? You think that's a lot of prayer? You think that's what God wants? How about 24 hours a day? How about every time you think of Him? You're peeling carrots, you're making a stew, you smell the carrots, they're so fresh. Lord, thank you so much. I can eat what I want, when I want, how much I want. What a blessing. Thank you, God. Now another notion of submission. In 1 Corinthians chapters 11 to 15, obviously not going to read those, but I think you're familiar with these, uh, this section. Paul explains the necessity for submission in corporate worship as well. In Romans 12, Paul is talking about my individual day, every day. I can be in worship to God. That's not to say that we just jettison all corporate worship, that you know, God doesn't care about that. Absolutely, God cares about that just different than our private worship. We don't have time to examine each subject that Paul discusses here, but obviously there were problems in the corporate or public worship assemblies of the Corinthian church. These included dress code, you know, veils for women to wear or not to wear, or proper behavior concerning fellowship meals and the Lord's Supper the value and the practice of spiritual gifts in the assembly. How should we do this? Now the thread that runs through all of these chapters is that these Christians were not using the gifts or participating in the rituals according to God's will. The answer was not, for example, well, as far as the veils are concerned, let the women wear what they want to wear, or let's just bar them from public worship altogether. That wasn't the answer. Or to do away with the fellowship meal and the communion because it just caused so much trouble. That wasn't the answer. Or to restrict tongue speaking or limit the service to one prayer and one teaching per week. In other words, Paul wasn't saying to them, hey, you guys make up your own rules about public worship. Not at all. The answer was to be in submission to God's will for public worship, just as one was in submission to His will for personal and private worship. It's all about submitting to God. And just as Paul briefly outlined what this meant for our everyday lives in Romans 12, 1 and 2, you know, purity, service, devotion, that's the exercise of submission from Monday to Saturday. He does the same for the public worship as well. Because of submission to God's will, which is the true practice of worship, because of that, 
the women continued in that day to wear their veils in conformity to the cultural norms of the time. And they were silent in the church, not leading or teaching in conformity to eternal and spiritual norms. And the common denom uh, denomination to both of these attitudes was submission to God's will. On one hand, the women did not contravene a cultural norm, in other words, just taking off their veils, because in taking off their veils and being exposed to that society meant that that woman was you know, immoral. So they did not contravene a cultural norm so as not to create a scandal. And on the other, they submitted to the eternal and spiritual norm, not cultural, of male spiritual leadership in the home and now in the church. Two different reasons, one single reaction. Submission to God, the true spirit of worship by the women at that time. And then the men also submitted to the order or to the process that Paul imposed in order to provide a more uniform assembly. Submission was the antidote to the chaos and the competition that was tearing apart this church. They had great software, you know, tongues, prophecy, knowledge, but were unable to communicate with God because there was very little submission to the divine order. And then, of course, everyone had to submit to one another in Christian love so that their witness to others would be effective. You know, Jesus said, this is how all men will know that you are my disciples in the way that you love one another, John 13, 35. Do you notice he didn't say, this is how all men will know that you're my disciples, how you love the lost or how you love the poor or how you love the world, but rather how you love one another? The chapter on love, 13, is really the nuts and bolts of how we are to submit one to another. Mutual submission is the practice of Christian love. It's the proof that we are disciples and our best witness for Christ. Without this kind of submission, there is no worship to God. If you cannot <laughs> submit yourself to your brother that you can see, how are you going to submit to God who you can't see? And so, in avoiding the extremes, focusing on the status quo and just maintaining the rituals and thinking if we can just improve the rituals, we'll have better communication with God. That's one extreme. And the other extreme is, well, let's just dump everything and try to create our own spiritual experience. Ah, uh -uh, that won't work either. We need to find the right balance to enhance our communication with God in worship. And that balance is an effort at being in submission both to His will, both in our personal everyday lives, which produces an ongoing spiritual and acceptable worship to God, and, and be in submission in our corporate assemblies, because God has also revealed the behavior and the attitude and the practice that He accepts during these times. I would rather be in a congregation where the brothers and sisters love each other and forgive each other their offenses and are there for each other than be in a congregation that sings well. Now if I can get both, I'm happy. If I can get a congregation that sings well and everybody loves each other, wow, that's, that's beautiful, that's perfect. But if I had a choice, these people love each other, but man, they got no ear. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I'll pick love or have, over having a good ear any day. In his famous devotional book entitled, My Utmost for His Highest, Oswald Chambers writes that we as Christians become broken bread and poured out wine. Isn't that a beautiful image? we become broken bread and poured out wine. A wonderful description of the merging of our personal and public worship as those who are in submission to God. And so what is the, how do we get better at worship? Personal submission to God each day, 
and submission to God's will when we are together. This submission not only elevates our communication to the threshold of heaven, it also brings us to the true blessings of worship. And the true blessing of worship, you ever wonder what do you get out of worship? What am I supposed to get out of it? Next week we're going to talk about what we're supposed to get out of worship. Again, in a word, the true benefit of worship, transcendence, transcendence. That's the benefit of communication with God, transcendence. And so next week we'll talk about transcendence. In the meantime, if you have not yet submitted your will to God's will in confessing the name of Christ, repenting of your sins, being baptized, then I exhort you this evening, if you haven't done that, please do that. Be in submission to His will through the gospel. And if you have been rebellious in your behavior, in your thoughts, in a way that has pushed God away from you and wish to be restored to a good relationship with Him, then let the elders of the church pray for you and encourage you in that. If you have a need at this time to respond to the invitation, we do encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing.